great. Um, I was in, I, I'm just really conscious right now of the, um, how terrible some of the evil things in this world that happen, how terrible they are. Um, Margareta handed me something um, this morning about what's happening in Iraq. I'm going to read it to you in just a moment. Um, I have to read it now. This, this is a plea from Canon White. You may know Canon White, Andrew White. He's spoken several times up at, um, at, uh, in, in, in Lusey, in St. Hughes's. Hughes. But this is what he writes. Dear friends, this is a message from Canon White, who is the vicar of Baghdad. Things are so bad now in Iraq, the worst they have ever been. And that's bad. The Islamic terrorists have taken control of the whole of Mosul, which is Nineveh, the main Christian stronghold. The army have fled. We urgently need help and support. Please, please help us in this crisis. Iraq is now in its worst crisis since 2000, the 2003 war. ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria group, a group that does not even see al-Qaeda as extreme enough, has moved into Mosul, which is Nineveh. It has total, totally taken control, destroyed all government departments, allowed all prisoners out of the prisons, killed countless numbers of people. There are bodies over the streets. The army and police have fled, so many of the military resources have been captured. Tankers, armored vehicles, and even helicopters are now in the hands of ISIS. The area is the heartland of the Christian community. Most of our people come from Nineveh and still see that as their home. It is, there, it is there that they return to regularly. Many Christians fled back from, fled from back, no, that's not English, fled back to Nineveh from Baghdad as things got so bad there. Now the Christian center of Iraq has been totally ransacked. The tanks are moving into the Christian villages, destroying them and causing total carnage. The ISIS militants are now moving towards Kirkuk, major areas of the oil fields that provide the lifeblood of Iraq. We are faced with total war that all the Iraqi military has now retreated from. People have fled in their hundreds of thousands to Kurdistan, still in Iraq for safety. The Kurds have even closed the border, preventing entry of the masses. The crisis is so huge, it is almost impossible to consider what is really happening. And then he goes on to plead for help um, from anyone who receives this message. Thank you. Um, it, it's tempting to think that we don't have anything of that here. But last week, um, I was on a, a course, a training course, two days, CAF training, um, Common Assessment framing, Framework, which is to help people who work with uh, families, um, the families of Luton, um, where um, there may be difficulties. And one of the components in the training was a lengthy session on spotting r the radicalization of children in Luton homes, how to spot it, and then what to do. Um, this is, a, is, a, is a, an eye-opener to the kind of times we may be moving into increasingly, even here. Um, evil is at large. God's spirit is in our midst now, and I have a beautiful sense as we were worshipping of um, the oil of running down on Aaron's beard because the brothers and sisters are worshipping together in unity. But over against that unity I sense in our midst this morning is the reality of evil. Um, I was in uh, Kent, back in Kent with my friends there, and um, just uh, the last two days, and one of Margareta and our dear friends, a lady from, from the Bahamas called Barbara, uh, was, her house was broken into in lovely Kent by three um, men who came with um, stockings over their heads so they couldn't be identified, and they attacked her, they uh, stole money from her and things from her, um, attacked her in an in overtly sexual way. And if though, as though that wasn't enough, she then told me that her dog, a new Alsatian dog that she had, has, had been killed. The men had, um, earlier to this attack on her, 
had thrown... Um, I'd never heard of this before. They'd thrown a kind of special burger over the fence, and in the middle of the burger is a kind of capsule which, when ingested with the burger, opens itself in the heat of the stomach, and then it releases a, a, a chemical which slowly and agonizingly kills the animal. So the vets took two weeks to try and save this dog and work out what had happened, and they couldn't. The dog died an agonizing death. And, you know, I asked myself, what can possess anybody to do that? And it's not as though evil is just over there somewhere. It's round and about us. And the question, I'm trying to link this with what I've prepared for this morning, and that, what I've prepared is the question, how... How can you and I be most effective for the kingdom of God here on earth? How can we be as effective as we possibly can to advance God's kingdom and bring his kingdom here on earth as we pray, your kingdom come? What do we need? I haven't got long to go in this. I've only got a little bit of ministry left. And I want to get this right. I want to have what I'm going to talk about is unlimited kingdom breakthrough. And whatever I have to do, whatever I have to change in my life, and whatever I have to be learn or be confronted about, I want to receive that so I can be effective for God in bringing about his kingdom. Are you with me? Right. I'm going to present to you a tool in a moment. I mean, to get away from here. I haven't done a PowerPoint for a long time, but here comes a little PowerPoint, which I hope you will find helpful, as our ministry leadership team did at its last meeting. Gosh, can you all see that? Am I in the way a little bit? I am now. Was I better where I was before? Is that okay now? Yes, you can all see it. Do feel free to move if you can't. You need to be able to see this um, slide. Okay, here you have a vertical axis. Can you see the arrow pointing upwards? Yeah? This represents character. So if I... Oh, it doesn't work on there, does it? Uh, the red um, light. Never mind. If you have a, 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 a fantastically godly character, you're right up the top there. If your character leaves something to be desired, you're down the bottom. Okay? That axis is... Christian character. Here we have the other axis, the horizontal axis. This is about competency. Competency. Have you noticed something there? Yeah? Come on, teachers. I've spelt it wrongly. Deliberately. I am incompetent when it comes to spelling. Yes? This is the competency axis. We need we need skills to be effective for God, yeah? If I were in the office and doing the administrator's job, I would have to sort this problem out, my spelling. Okay, so here you have the two um, axes, Christian character, I've spelled it correctly now, and competency on the other axis. Are you with me? Okay, think of Johnny Wilkinson for a moment. He's the one that came to mind. What kind of skill has he got? Competency as a rugby player. Who's a rugby player? Right, thank you. That's, that's excellent. Well put. He's very good at kicking the ball over those two things, isn't he? And he spent years and years and years practicing it. Even after a match and everybody had gone home, he carried on refining that skill. Because to be a successful rugby player, he had to be able to do that. Yeah? One of the world's best. But what kind of character did Johnny Wilkerson, does he have? What, how would you rate him 0 to 10, 0 being bad character and 10 being good? Yeah, 10. He, 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 he's not, not all sportsmen have the, the qualities of the sportsman character uh, that Johnny Wilkerson has. So he therefore got knighted for his competency and his character, I would suggest. And he's a, a kind of national icon, an example of the, a great sportsman with a great spirit and great skill, yeah? You with me? What kind of 
um, we, we're trying to raise up a new bookkeeper for our church, yeah? What kind of competencies would they need to have? They'd need to be able to add up. Thank you, Diane. What kind of character would they need to have? Honest? Trustworthy? Methodical? Speaks, speaks an accountant. Reliable? There's something else I'm looking for here, really important. We've been talking about it. Confidential. Because they will see what I give to the church and what you give to the church. Only this person sees it. So they have to be, have real, real character to not disclose anything that they see. Yeah? High character, high competency will, we will have. I don't know which one of you it's going to be, but we're praying you in. Now, here comes some, some more stuff. Can you see this stuff that comes in? I'm going to have to read it out to you. Okay, now, if you have high character and high competency, you're over here, yeah? <coughs> Bear with me. If you have a high character and high competency, you're up over here in the right top quadrant, yes? And there, you can re- achieve unlimited kingdom breakthrough. Whatever the equivalent of what Johnny Wilkinson does, uh, that's the kind of thing that you will achieve for God here on earth. If you have low character and high competency, this, this is really important to get this, low character and high competency, yeah? Within the kingdom of God, you have unlimited potential for harm. Mm -hmm. Do you get that? We're going to look at that in a minute from Scripture. Okay. If you have high character, you're a fantastic, lovely, godly person, but you are incompetent, yeah? Then you would be like the the, the church, a church... um, uh, bookkeeper who has all the glorious gifts of character that you could ever wish for but can't add up. Not a lot of use. Do you see? So, you would have limited potential for kingdom breakthrough. Are you with me? Okay. Down here, you have low character, low or no competency, apathy, and death. Okay? Let's hope you find that helpful. Now, I want you to think the biblical character in the New Testament called Saul. Can you remember Saul? Yeah? Here's how he describes himself in Philippians towards the end of his life. Here's Saul. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 4 to 6. If Others think they have reasons to put confidence in their flesh. I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. That's where he described his former life. Then, as you know, Saul had an encounter with the living God, the Lord Jesus, on the Damascus Road. And after that, his whole life was transformed. And if you look at Philippians 3, verses 7 to 8 now, the next bit, he goes on then to say, but whatever were gains to me, in other words, whatever competencies and uh, uh, um, pedigrees I may have had, I now consider them lost for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So he goes on. Okay. So, 
there we have Okay, can you see now, here is, I need to take the mic, can you see in the bottom right thing, it's, there was Saul the Pharisee, the old man, Saul the Pharisee, persecuted the church, high competency, high pedigree, but an awful character, yeah? And following his Damascus Road experience where he encountered Jesus, he then became Paul. His name was changed, yeah, following that experience. And his character was changed, and his competency was high. So he then had unlimited kingdom breakthrough. And having been the most di a disaster for the, the church of God, he then became the greatest evangelist who ever lived. Do you see? He moved from being Saul, a disaster area, to being Paul, St. Paul, who we wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for his mission. Okay. Now, I want to look at what actually happened. I want to look at Acts 22, because this is Paul's own account of what happened on that Damascus road when he encountered the living Lord Jesus Acts 22 and verse 3, I'm going to read from there. He describes this transition in his life. Paul said, he's now on speaking to a crowd, giving account to them. I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city. I studied under Gamaliel, and I was thoroughly trained in the law of our ancestors. I was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women and throwing them into prison, as the high priest and all the council could themselves testified. I obtained letters from them to their associates in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. Now verse six, about noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, who are you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you have been assigned to do. That's the dramatic moment. That's the kairos moment in, in Saul's life when God breaks in, the risen Lord Jesus breaks into his life and begins to convict him. You are persecuting me. You are persecuting my church. Yeah? Now, then, what did Paul, Saul, Paul, then do? What did he actually do to sort it all out? What did he do to become the greatest missionary that the world has ever known? Galatians, he gives us the answer. He tells us what he actually did. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 to 24. Galatians 1, 13 to 24. Writing to the Galatians, he explains what he did. For you have heard of my previous way in the life of Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism, competence, advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. We would call it now, an, he was a religious extremist. But when God, who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, get this bit. 
after three years, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, the apostle, and stayed with him 15 days. Okay. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother, and I assure you before God that what I'm writing to you is no lie. Saul had been completely oblivious, unaware of his character faults. Saul encounters Jesus and is convicted of his character faults. He's completely got it wrong. The, the text moves from calling him Saul to calling him Paul. And what does Paul then do? He withdraws to seek God for three years in the desert. Because his whole mind needs to be reprogrammed. He may be the incredibly competent, but his character is a disaster. He's the most arrogant man that's ever lived, you might have. He was with doors into the, to the, the desert for three years. And only then does he consult Peter, the apostle, who had spent three years with Jesus. Can you imagine how those conversations might have been, those two weeks that Paul had with Peter? I can imagine, so, oh, it's all like this. You've got to obey every letter of the law, haven't you, Peter? No, when Jesus was with us, when Jesus was with us, he wasn't like that at all. He was full of grace and truth and love and compassion and humility. That's what the scriptures point to. Not a legal observation of all the rules. You can be as competent as you like, but you can be so competent and yet completely miss the plot. Can you imagine Paul beginning to get it? God speaking to him through his three years with silent retreat, and then God speaking to him through Peter, who knew the Lord Jesus. And only then, after all of that reprogramming, is Paul ready to begin his mission. What kind of man was this born-again Saul, this Paul? He was full of humility. He spoke, spoke, he wrote of being crucified with Christ. Not I live, but he lives in me. He was he had died to himself. It was no longer about how many certificates of competence he'd got. It was all about Christ living in him. He was now spirit-led and not self-led. He had no longer a tribal vision, a vision only for his own people. But he now had a vision for the whole of humankind that everyone on earth would come to confess that Jesus is Lord. He had a, his vision having been tribal and now it became global. He became a team player. He became a man who realized that without others he couldn't do it. So he worked together with others, with Barnabas and so on, and, uh, and uh, um, good morning, with other people. Um, and planted churches and worked together to raise up leaders. Um, and then having raised up the leaders, he would leave them, uh, support them from a, a distance by his letters, and let them get on with it. He was a man, this new man, this Paul, this born-again man, who was willing to leave his comfort zones and suffer actually anything at all that the kingdom of God might advance. He was, had an absolutely clear focus on what he was trying to achieve. He was completely focused on the gospel of Christ, and he could see through what the gospel was, the jewel of the gospel, over against all other things going on around him that might have deflected his attention. And crucially, he grasps, doesn't he, that love is the key. 1 Corinthians 13. He knows that without love, the whole thing is just ugly. Now, important question. 
Was Saul's first life, his life before his Damascus Road conversion, was that just a waste? No. It wasn't a waste, because he got all kinds of skills in his training to be a Pharisee. He must have known what we would call the Old Testament back to front, huge passages of scripture from memory. He could have recited them in Hebrew, in Greek, I could imagine in Latin as well. He was hugely competent. He was conversant with the whole uh, body of uh, Greco-Roman philosophy. He could argue the pants of anybody. He was a hugely skilled man. And he had acquired all those skills before his conversion experience. You might like to imagine a brilliant accountant person, kind of person we're looking for, to be our bookkeeper, but who has a disastrous character. <laughs> yeah? And suddenly he comes to faith and his character is gradually reformed and you realize here is our person, here is our woman who has all the skills and all the godliness now to be our bookkeeper. Yeah? Thank God she learned how to add up in her first life. <laughs> You see? Okay. So it's then about the um, competencies being recycled for God's kingdom rather than um, directed um, as forces of evil. Yeah? So the Old Testament speaks of us uh, recycling our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks, taking those things which were weapons for war and recycling those same things and turning them into uh, um, uh, instruments for harvesting the crops. So, if you imagine uh, a Johnny Wilkinson or a sportsman who's doing it all for his own glory, just that he might be famous, and get, you know, and be adored by the whole world, yeah, being converted and coming to Christ and getting a godly character. Mm -hmm then all of a sudden those same skills are brought to the glory of God rather than to his own glory. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Okay. This is really important. So you might like to imagine a born-again Hitler. What would, what would have happened to the history of, of, of the world if Hitler had had a Damascus Road experience? He was a brilliant man. He designed whole cities and architect, you know, with architectural skills and had a great vision for a new Europe, a new world. He had a, an exciting vision. The only problem was it was fundamentally flawed because it was for his own glory and the glory of the German nation, Nazism at its very worst. And to achieve his vision, he had to eliminate all kinds of groups like Jews and Roma and homosexuals and handicapped and everything else. It was fundamentally evil. But can you imagine a Hitler who had had a Damascus Road experience? What he might have done for God, this man? Why did nobody challenge him? Somebody should have challenged this man. He might have got a bullet in the head. Bonhoeffer got pretty close to challenging him. Niemöller as well. What, is, what might have happened to the history of this world if Stalin and Marx might have been converted to, to Christ? The whole hi horse of human history would have gone in a different direction. Do you see how important this is? That competency without character is unlimited potential for harm. But competency with high character, unlimited potential for kingdom breakthrough. Do you want that? Do you want that not just for the man sitting next to you or the woman around there who you know is a good person? Do you want it for yourself? Who wants it? Who wants that? Wave a hand if you want that or think it's for somebody else. Does anybody not want that? Come on, tell me. Does anybody not want that? This is a shake-up. Now, when I saw this teaching, it comes from... Um, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It comes from the Order of Mission, which I'm a part of. There's a little app to explain it. I took it to the MLT a bit nervously. We met on a Saturday morning at 6 o'clock here in church. 
about a month ago. And I was really excited about this teaching. And they, I thought, that they look, oh, they look really asleep, you know. And kept going on and on. This is what you've laid on my heart, God. I'm going to keep going. Kept going. Explain all the stuff I've just explained to you. And then said, I said to them, okay, I'm really serious about this for me. I've passed my sell-by date. I haven't got a long to go. And I can't see myself as you can see me. I can see the log in your eye easily as peasy. I can't chip in, chip, what is it called, the speck in your eye. I can't see the log in my eye because I'm, I'm looking at you, not at me. How wonderful Jesus' teaching is on that, isn't it? So I said, you can see me. You have been hand-picked, you ministry leadership team people, as for gifts of character and competencies. I'm leaving the room now. I'm going outside to make myself a cup of tea. Character comp- um, defaults there. Um, and you're going to tell me what my faults are. Came back half an hour later. Andrew had been appointed to be the spokesman, or I think he is. And here are my faults. I'm working on them. None of these will be surprises to you. You've known this stuff for five years. <laughs> but I need you to be told this, because I want to work on this. And they need God's help and your help to make progress. Sometimes, Martin, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're on fire for God, but really, a lot of the time, you aren't. I'm, I'm paraphrasing it and putting it more bluntly than it was put. Okay. You need to be more full with God's Holy Spirit and speak out what is on God's heart. We need it. We need to hear this from you. Two, you have your favorites. And you are not fully impartial. True. Very true. Don't even need to unpack it so true. Who does Martin talk to? We all know who he talks to. Who does he not talk to? We all know who he doesn't talk to. This has to change. Three, seek to grow in competency, competency in prophetic and the apostolic. Need to grow in that. Four, It's the same as two. Grow in the areas where there is no natural gifting being there equally for all people. Yes, I have no natural gifting from that, but that doesn't mean to say I can't become more competent in being there for everybody. So it's both a weakness of character and an incompetence that has to be addressed in my life. And then the last one is really good. It's lofty theological preaching from Scripture rarefied ideas, but we need to hear how to apply it in real life. All very well, all these highfalutin ideas, but what difference does it make to me? Five points. Thank you, ministry leadership team, for pointing this out to me. What is staring you in the face? So I then went back to the staff team, to, to Lee and to Wendy. Leslie was on holiday. And, and, and uh, Lee said, that was good, and I want to do it now. I want to go through that. That was amazing. And I think I'm correct in saying, Wendy, but correct me if I'm wrong. You said, too, you want to do that. They want to go through the same process. And you see, I said, I had said to the ministry leadership team, look, for 20, no, 35 years, I've had people fill out pieces of paper about me, writing all the nice things down about Martin. And I read these things, oh, how lovely. <laughs> it's really cool. And it's an encouragement, yeah, okay, I'm not getting everything wrong, but I don't actually grow through that stuff. So I, I said, I was saying, please, I want another bit of paper, and I want to know what isn't good enough. See? 
Start with me. Start with the person who nobody dares to correct. Or put up, well, actually, you do, thank you. But <laughs> are you with me? And it can be done, it was done in a, a, a spirit of love and gentleness, but very clearly by the ministry leadership team for me. And I haven't got long to get this, make some real progress in this. That's why I'm so excited about it. Because I want to see, coming back to where I started this morning, I want to know how I can stand against evil, yeah, wherever it is, and be effective. Right? And there's two ways of accounting evil. You either do what Jimmy would do, and that's boom, right? Or you do what I would do, and flee, fight, or flight. Somewhere in the middle of that is the Jesus way of confronting evil with love. I want to learn how to do that. That the world, by the time I leave it, is just a little bit better than it would have been otherwise. You with me? And only together, do you see, can we do this. Good. It's now exactly, slightly gone, quarter to twelve. So the children are coming down, aren't they, Lee? If you're still talking to me, yeah? And um, they're coming down, and we're gonna, you're going to come forward in a minute, um, and Brendan's gone to get them. And Ted's looking at his watch. So meanwhile, I shall publish the bands of marriage between Clifford Frederick Shulver of this parish and Angela Thompson, also of this parish, who plan to be married in St. Mary's Church in Milton Keynes. If anyone knows why Clifford and Angela should not be married, please see me after the service. This is the, for the third time of asking. Andrew. Yes, please. Um, needless to say, it was a very awkward and uncomfortable experience for the ministry leadership team <laughs> the other week when Martin asked us for that kind of input because the reality is, unfortunately, I think in Christian community, we have, we've interpreted the command to love one another to generally mean to be nice to each other. But love and niceness are not the same at all. And actually loving Martin as the ministry leadership team should somewhere include uh, probably not a formal list of failings, but that somehow Martin hears from those near him, and that would include others, not just the ministry leadership team. These are some areas that I see God wants to grow you. And how you say that and the love that underpins that are a real challenge for us, aren't they? Because somehow it, it, often those comments, if we do give them, actually come out of a place of frustration and irritation with each other. And so in my home <laughs> with my wife, uh, such comments do fly around, uh, but they often don't come from a place of love. They come from a place of, let me tell you, something I'm seeing, which I think is a speck in your eye. It's not coming from a place that says, actually, we both have logs and we need to help each other see them. And I think, uh, just this is me surmising, why um, Lee, <coughs> excuse me, and Wendy have both articulated, and I think in truth all of us would want to say a desire for something similar, is we all know we have logs. We all know we have blind spots. Um, and I, I know this is not why Martin mentioned it, but I, I want to just, I, I really want to affirm the humility that stands behind everything Martin has said, that it was a very humble step to publicly say, I'm not in unlimited kingdom potential, I'm over in limited kingdom potential, and I want to move along that axis to greater potential for God's kingdom. The reality is, you're still a relatively young man, so one way or another, the, the uh, impact you're having for the kingdom is going to carry on for another 20 or 30 years, however long God gives you. 
And there isn't an end to that. I think as, as Paul said, you know, I, I am the chief of sinners, he saw more clearly towards the end his sin, but it would appear that somehow in the midst of that, his effectiveness for the kingdom was increasing. And so I, I suppose I just want, I want to publicly commend Martin for what he did in that occasion with the ministry leadership team, but invite that we too somehow would step into that place, and this is very difficult because we don't function naturally as a community that speaks the truth in love with one another, but that is basic Bible teaching, that we would be a place where we truth in love with each other. And so by the grace of God, there would be uh, ways that I would not come and go from this place and three years from now still be the sa basically the same Andrew, but that iron would sharpen iron. There would be, through the relationships, the active relationships we have one, with one another, loving each other, the spirit of Jesus would be coming more and more alive in us because, frankly, that's what this neighborhood needs. That's what Luton needs. That's what the world is crying out for, is not people who are nice with each other, although it's not bad to be nice, but it's people who love each other, and that includes walking in deep humility that's willing to receive input, correction, reproof, as well as all the encouragement and affirmation that we need. So thank you, Martin, for apostolically leading out in that. And it meant a great deal on that day, and it means a great deal again this morning to hear that from you. Thanks. Do you still want us to do some worship, or children are now here?